This is intimidating, all this technology. I can hardly see you. Um, I met Vince uh, in a very weird hotel in L.A. It was all black, literally. The whole hotel was black. And uh, he came to uh, interview me. And uh, I thought we were going to have this nice conversation, you know. And within minutes, we were in the deep end of the pool. And then we went down even lower, not to go down the drain, but it really had this feeling that instantly we were really exploring the actual edge, moment to moment, of how some kind of natural process is constructing consciousness, moment after moment after moment. So in this presentation, which I hope to do with some experiential practices and definitely some Q&A and discussion and comments, um, I'd like to explore with you what is that edge? As soon as my slides show up, but whatever. Um, not that I need them as a crutch or anything, but I do. <laughs> but anyway, um, I was talking with Vince earlier about how uh, TED Talks, when I was Lee Brasington, how TED Talks were kind of changing the way people teach. And, you know, people talk about how PowerPoint has changed the way we teach. Also another kind of technology. But anyway, what I hope to explore with you is how to ground the mind in life and how to ground Dharma practice in life, uh, in the evolution of the nervous system over 600 million years, and in particular, how can we know a little bit or even a lot about the three pounds of tofu, right, inside the coconut? That's the final common pathway of all the causes streaming through us, moment after moment after moment, to make this sense of consciousness that we're having right now. So that's what I'm interested in, creating kind of a frame and how to think about uh, embedding Dharma practice in human biology and evolutionary neuropsychology altogether. So that's the intention. And then in terms of good, my slides are up, so let me try to have control. I don't yet have control. All right, will this give me control? This doesn't give me... It is giving me control. You're in control? I'm in control. Now I'm in control. I'm feeling so much better. All right, so... Good. Oh. This is interesting. Bear with me. This is not in control. Oh. Okay. Some of my slides are out of order. This is good. I'm going to have to think on my feet. <laughs> okay. Here we go. So, I want to talk about, as soon as the clicker works, the intersection of these three circles. Here we go. And uh, you can imagine what could be found really at the center of these three circles. You know, the contemplative traditions in Buddhism are the ones I know best, 2,500 or so years old. Other great religions in the world, uh, including the indigenous shamanic traditions, have a contemplative wing, as do certainly the secular traditions. So there's this ancient, this ancient stream of wisdom, and uh, it has come to intersect increasingly with modern brain science and modern neuropsychology. As I think the next slide shows, Oppenheimer talks here, about the history of science being rich in the examples of bringing two things together. Uh, when I, uh, just the title, Buddhist Geeks, you know, brings two things together. So I just think that's where some very cool stuff is. You think about tidal pools and the emergence of life. Uh, you think about cultures coming together. So how can we bring this territory of powerful contemplative practice that is never needed an EEG or an MRI to have its impact? How do we bring that together? with modern culture, modern technology, and a deepening understanding of the underlying causes of this moment of consciousness. You know, the Buddha, for example, engaged the causes of suffering and its end. That's what he said he taught. One thing, right? Suffering and its end. Um, he engaged those causes at the level of the mind. That's all he knew. He made reference to nature in many of his metaphors, many of his examples. Um, but as far as he was concerned, all he knew was, in effect, the, what was above the waterline. Today, though, we're increasingly able to embed or nest the mental causes of suffering and its end in terms of the underlying neural, biological causes of suffering and its end. And what interests me a lot is how to mine that territory for practical purposes. Okay. So... There we go. Now, to do that, of course, we need a certain empiricism. I love this quote, when the facts change, I change my mind, what do you do? So it's in that territory that I hope to proceed. Okay, so 
Grounding in the brain pitfalls. Bear with me for a second. So just so you know, this is very different than I thought I was going to be presenting. <laughs> this has never happened to me before. So bear with me. Do do do. How do I proceed this more rapidly? It's not proceeding. It's really funny, at a Buddhist Geeks conference, I can't make the technology work. All right. Wow, this is great. All right. Okay. So, you know, I've never had to do this, but I'm going to totally have a good time. This is how we're going to do it. So you're going to take me through this, right? So we're going to start here. No. These are not progressing very well. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to do something totally different. All right, screw it. Here we go. All right. Good. I really love the irony. Is really fantastic, you know. And like a technology thing, you know, I've got to get off the technology. All right. So we're going to actually practice. All right. So I want to make a few points. First point is that in the natural frame that I'm going to be working in, it acknowledges that there may be a transcendental. There may be an X factor, right? Call it God, call it the ground, the nameless, something supernatural, if you will. But otherwise, moment to moment, bottom line, what we think, what we feel, the aggregates, uh, the feeling tone of moment to moment experience, our perceptions, awareness itself must be the result of natural processes. What that means operationally is that moment to moment mental activity whether it's unconscious in terms of information flows in the nervous system that are outside of awareness, which is where the great bulk of the mind resides. You know, in the standpoint of neuroscience, uh, the nervous system is an information processing system. And mind, or synonyms like mental, refer to information. So we have this information processing system that stores information, represents it, transports it, communicates it, operates upon it, and so forth. We have this system that's physical, that's representing non-physical, immaterial information. You can't weigh information. It's intangible. You can't um, hold up meaning in your hand, right? And yet, in the nervous system, much as in a computer, much as in the marks on the screen, we can see that some kind of underlying physical concrete substrate represents non-physical information. That technically and Philosophy is called dual aspect monism. As soon as I came across that phrase, I knew I would use it to impress my family. But <laughs> our young adult kids, they were totally not interested. So anyway, so the, the model, the naturalist model, if you will, of the mind-brain system uh, involves uh, immaterial information, mental activity. That's how I'll use that word, represented by underlying neural activity uh, in such a way that they co-arise. Uh, they are interdependent with each other. Uh, the interesting thing is that ongoing patterns of neural activity leave lasting traces in neural structure. The nervous system, uh, and the brain in particular, the headquarters of the nervous system, is the organ that learns. It is designed to learn from our experiences. That's experience-dependent neuroplasticity. Okay? That's the basic frame in which I'm going to work. This means, in a fundamental way, that what the Buddha said when he talked about how the mind takes its shape from whatever it rests upon. This means, fundamentally, that the brain takes its shape from whatever our mind rests upon. Because experience-dependent neuroplasticity, the ways in which what we think and feel, both consciously and unconsciously, is shaping the nervous system, that process of neuroplasticity, summarized in the famous line, neurons that fire together, wire together, that process of neuroplasticity is turbocharged for what's in the field of focused attention. That means that where we rest our attention uh, is deeply, deeply shaping the mind, or the brain rather, for better or worse. If we routinely rest our attention on worrying about our slides, right? or rest our attention on grumbling or complaining to ourselves about ourselves or self-criticism or anxious rumination, well, over time, 
we will have a brain that is increasingly sensitized to the negative, right? Uh, we'll have a brain that's increasingly depleted of serotonin, a neurotransmitter that supports mood. We'll have a brain in which the amygdala, the alarm bell of the brain, is increasingly sensitized and goes off more and more rapidly. And we'll have a brain due to chronic flows of the stress hormone cortisol, in which another part of, called the hippocampus gradually loses cells because they're killed by cortisol, a stress hormone, losing up to a quarter of the volume. And the hippocampus is a very important part of the brain. It's involved in making new memories, uh, but it's also involved in putting things in context and calming down the amygdala and telling another part of the brain, the hypothalamus, to quit calling for stress hormones. You see the vicious cycle. It means that stress today, resting our mind on worries and anger and anxiety and the rest of that, stress today um, releases cortisol that makes the brain more vulnerable to stress tomorrow, which makes it really vulnerable to stress the day after. And it's important to appreciate, to pick up on a theme I'll be getting to momentarily, that ancient systems that evolved in very, very harsh conditions in which the mortality rate was very, very high, these ancient systems that helped our ancestors uh, survive charging tigers or lethal aggression in their primate band, these same systems are locked and loaded today when we're stuck in traffic or doing too many emails or dealing with a frown across a dinner table or with somebody who, you know, does the eye roll, right? And like, what are you doing to me? The same systems that evolved to take care of raw survival get going if we're irritated, frazzled, anxious, or upset. So if we rest our minds routinely there, the brain will take a certain shape. On the other hand, if we rest our mind, if we rest our intention increasingly on things that are factually based and useful, uh, our everyday accomplishments, uh, the kindness of other people. I've received a lot of kindness from Buddhist geeks already today. People who picked me up, brought me here, have taken care of me and all the rest of that. Uh, a sense of the goodness in our own heart. Um, a felt sense of compassion or caring or steadiness of mind, steadiness of attention. If we rest our attention there, the brain will take a different shape. We'll get more activation, left prefrontal cortex for right-handed people and roughly half of all lefties. It's reversed for roughly half of all left-handed people. But anyway, for most people, you get more activation in the left side if you rest your mind routinely on the everyday positive experiences of daily life. You build up resilience of various kinds in various systems uh, in your brain. And the result of which is you feel more confident, more resilient, and stronger in how you deal with life. That's the essence of the opportunity, really, that we have the capacity to use the mind to change the brain, to change the mind for the better. That's the essence of self-directed neuroplasticity. And while neuroscience is a baby science, uh, we're just really in the frontier of what's increasingly being learned about the most important, the most central organ in the body. Even though we're just at the beginning of that, it is increasingly clear that there are a lot of connections between mental activity and underlying neural activity. And with increasingly skillful means, we can stimulate the neural circuits that underlie wholesome states of mind. The factors of awakening in Buddhism, such as tranquility, or investigation, or rapture, right, or equanimity. We can rest our mind on certain um, things that stimulate those circuits, and then because neurons that fire together wire together, therefore strengthen them. And that has tremendous value, I think, for Dharma practice. So I'll mention four ways in which I think neuroscience is actually useful for Dharma practice, and I would say for healing and everyday well-being and effectiveness and you know, self-actualization and personal growth in general. There are a lot of ways that neuroscience, even though I'm very steeped in that world, uh, my training is a psychologist, neuropsychologist. Uh, I've been meditating since 1974, and uh, I teach um, meditation and, and the Dharma in general. So it's from that standpoint that's very practical you know, that I've gotten very interested in this. That said, I think there's a lot of old wine in new bottles. I think there's a lot of brain science brought into Dharma practice and psychology that doesn't add any value. It's kind of cool. You know, you can sell books. You want to sell books these days, put brain in the title. Not that I'd ever do that, right? <laughs> so, four kinds of benefits, right? First is that it's motivating. Conviction. 
You know, you may know conviction, faith, confidence. It's one of the five spiritual powers in Buddhism. And by developing conviction, motivation, um, we become more willing to practice, we hang in there, we stay with it. Knowing somehow that what you do isn't just resulting in something sort of ineffable in the benefits, but it's actually changing your brain. It's actually physical. It's going into the meat, you know? can motivate people to be more careful about where they rest their mind in terms of things that don't help them and be more motivated to shift their attention to something better. Second, the brain is an organizing uh, framework. Uh, If you look at Buddhism and as it's moved throughout the world, there's this diversity of approaches. And frankly, there has been, historically certainly, a fair amount of sectarianism. Um, Inside the natural frame, there's only one brain, fundamentally. So whether we talk about those neural mental processes within a Theravadan frame, in terms of the early teachings of Buddhism, or within a Tibetan frame, or a Zen frame, or a pure land frame, or some other sort of frame, at the end of the day, in, inside the natural frame, you're just talking about one brain. The third benefit, I think, of bringing neuroscience into practice is that it highlights methods that are not being invented by neuroscience, but are actually really, really important. So, for example, one of the benefits I've seen from bringing um, neuroscience into Dharma practice is a deeper appreciation of embodiment. It's really funny for me, you know, as a, I was like king of the dorks, or at least the dork club, you know, when I was growing up through school, total nerd, and um, very much in my head. And it's interesting that all this sort of intellectual firepower around uh, neurodharma, if you will, brings us back into the body. Because you realize that most of the learning and most of what's really, really consequential uh, in, in terms of the brain has to do with deeply embodied processing. We privilege language. Uh, we're good at it, right? You know, we privilege uh, consciousness. But most of what's going on in terms of the streams of mental activity, the information flows through the neural networks, most of that is, has nothing to do with verbal activity. And it's very much about managing bodily systems and deep, deep motivations and feelings. So the more in which uh, our practice comes back into the body in a very, very deep way, uh, the more we come home to ourselves. And I think neuroscience has made contributions in that regard. It also makes contributions in terms of neurological diversity. There are many different types of meditators. Uh, If you think of it... um, You know, as we evolved in small bands that bred mainly internally, having a diversity of temperament was adaptive uh, for, you know, when competing with other bands. If you think of something like, you know, jackrabbits here, the territory of spirited ADHD, you know, territory, tweeners, and then turtles at the other end of the temperamental spectrum, right? You know, bands that were only turtles or only jackrabbits or only tweeners didn't do so well competing against other bands. So it's natural to have jackrabbity temperaments. The problem is most contemplative practices, I think, were developed by turtles for turtles and turtle pens, <laughs> you know, to make a better turtles, right? But what do you do if you're a jackrabbit by nature or you've grown up in a jackrabbity culture, right, where you're habituated in your brain to a very dense incoming stream of stimulation? How do you adapt traditional methods for steadiness of mind for jackrabbits, as it were? And that, too, I think, is where uh, neuroscience is something useful to say about individualizing practice and respecting individual differences because neurological diversity is the deep natural diversity. It's not a constructed, socially or culturally constructed form of diversity. It has really high impact. So that's, anyway, an illustration of, I think, the third benefit of bringing neuroscience into contemplative practice. The fourth one is that occasionally... Uh, knowing something about the machinery of the brain actually suggests new methods. And neurofeedback is an example of that, brainwave devices, uh, technology coming in to um, accelerate or enrich or enhance practice. I don't think technology or you know, these new methods are going to replace traditional methods, but they can enrich practice for busy householders who really want to go deep and don't have uh, the time to do long retreat practice as a major part of their life, you know, month in and month out. I want to illustrate momentarily, or talk about at least, depending on where my slides are, who knows? Um, You know, another innovation, I think, but to do that, I want to talk about evolution. 
Okay. So, so good. So far, so good. Okay. It's cool. Okay. This is a trip to do this. I've never had to do this before. It's good for me. Trust me. It's good for me. All right. I want to talk about evolution. All right. And the negativity bias. So if you're searching through my slides somewhere, negativity bias. Anything that looks like three layers of the brain. Okay. So I'll use my brain as a visual device here. So here you are. So as we evolved, basically over 600 million years of evolution of the nervous system. So quick context, probably familiar for most people here. Life's been on the planet roughly 3.5, 3.7-ish, maybe 3.5 billion years. Multi-celled creatures arose about 650 million years ago. And they got complicated enough after roughly another, nope, but it's okay. Um, <laughs> You know, another uh, 50 million years of evolution that their sensory systems and their motor systems needed to communicate with each other. They needed to exchange information. Thus, the beginning of the nervous system. And now, 600 million years later, you know, from ancient jellyfish, literally, through, you know, fish and creatures crawling out, reptiles, and then mammals about 200 million years ago, primates around 40 million years ago, and then uh, stone tool manufacturing, hominids, about 2.5, 2.7 million years ago. Who could make stone tools, which I can't do, uh, with a brain a third our size? You know, the brain has been evolving. Uh, and the nervous system has been evolving for a long time. And the results are present inside our heads today. So to simplify, the brain developed essentially like the floors of a house in three layers. Brain stem, subcortex, cortex. This is the triune brain model from Paul McLean. It's a simplification. I think it's a useful fiction. Then, to take it a step further, related to these three layers of the brain were three major stages of evolution. Loosely defined, reptilian, mammalian, primate human. Okay? So, right? And then, also, as the brain evolved, so did its capacity to meet our three fundamental needs which is a major framework that I'll be working, working with here. First need, of course, is safety. Rule one in the wild is eat lunch today, don't be lunch today, all right? And then a second major need is satisfaction. We've got to get those carrots. We have to get those mating opportunities, all right? We need to experience some kind of accomplishment or reward, particularly as the nervous system gets increasingly sophisticated. And the third fundamental core need is for connection for a relationship. Maybe that's handled in a very elemental way uh, by ancient creatures or simple creatures today, uh, or it's handled in very sophisticated ways today uh, as people have relationships with each other. All right. Now, loosely, these needs and the ways in which the brain goes about meeting these needs are linked to this reptilian, mammalian, and primate human stage of evolution. But the whole brain works together to meet those needs. That said, I think of myself as like, I have like an inner zoo. You know, I have a lizard, a mouse, and a monkey inside. It's kind of how it feels, <laughs> anyway, to me personally. And um, if you think about it, a lot of life boils down to pet the lizard, feed the mouse, hug the monkey, you know, <laughs> in terms of our three core needs, right? So we have these broad motivational regulatory systems that manage this for us. They avoid harms, meeting our safety need, needs. They approach rewards, meeting our needs for satisfaction. And they attach to others, right, in terms of our needs for connection. So I'm building kind of a model here. It's not unique to me. I've adapted the work of lots of other people. It's, it's a useful simplification like models are. But see what you think about it. Because what I'm working my way toward here is trying to operationalize the second and third noble truths. How do we neurologically, neuropsychologically, biologically, grounding in life, conceive of craving? Right? And in particular, how do we conceive of the end of craving? And then how do we uh, use that knowledge in practical ways? So maybe what I'll do with you right here is that I'll kind of complete my model and then pause for breath, uh, see if there are any questions or comments so far, and then go into some very practical implications. So, when we experience, or an animal experiences, that its core needs are met, when there's a basic sense of safety, a basic sense of satisfaction, a basic sense of connection, 
at whatever level is appropriate for that animal, including us, the brain defaults to its resting state, its homeostatic equilibrium condition that is, um, uh, can be perpetuated relatively easily. And the body repairs and refuels itself in this state. I call it the responsive mode. Other people have used that term as well. Uh, really to simplify, I think of it as the green zone in a nutshell. So in this state, the body refuels itself, it repairs itself. Um, because it's homeostatic, it can stay in that place. And in three broad umbrella terms, in terms of our needs for safety, satisfaction, and connection, in terms of the avoiding, approaching, and attaching systems of the brain, the mind is colored by peace, contentment, and love. Okay. In this state, there is no um, basis for craving. There's no deficit or disturbance, which is the engine of craving. And craving, in turn, is a major engine, arguably the engine, of suffering and harm. So how do we get to a place where there's no underlying basis for craving? It's to experience that our deep needs are met, particularly for safety, satisfaction, and connection. Mother Nature wants us to spend, wants animals, including us, to spend most of their time in the green zone. Because in the green zone, it's sustainable. Right? You're just kind of hanging out. You're a zebra in the wild. You're kind of hanging out. You know, you're looking around a little bit. Mostly you're just chill. You're in a good place. That's the green zone, right? And then comes along a lion, right? Lion attacks the herd, right? And the zebras run. But fairly quickly, they're back to the green zone. Because as Robert Sapolsky talks about it in his great book, Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers, uh, most stressful episodes in the wild end quickly, one way or another. <laughs> I, had a, I had a surgeon client once, I'm a therapist too, of course, and um, he said, you know, Rick, in the OR we have a saying, all bleeding stops eventually, one way or another, you know. Uh, so that's kind of, I'm not sure I wanted him as my surgeon, but anyway. Okay, so where was I? Oh, yeah, so that's one setting of the brain. It's kind of a strange attractor, if you think about it, in terms of complex systems theory. The brain goes to this place. On the other hand, Mother Nature helped our ancestors evolve a second setting of the brain. Uh, the one that kicks into gear when we experience that one or more of our core needs is, a, is not met. Right? We experience a sense of threat in terms of safety or frustration or disappointment or loss in terms of our needs to approach re, uh, rewards. Or we experience some sense of loneliness or, or shame, the social emotions. Or we've just been voted off the island, as it were, or dismissed in terms of our attaching needs. When that happens, the brain goes into a different setting. It tips into its reactive mode, a term that I've used and other people have used as well, or to simplify, the red zone. We fire up, sympathetic nervous system activates, stress hormones release, and we kind of have a spike, as time flows this way, of red zone reactivity, right? Now, in the wild, the plan is for those spikes of red zone reactivity to be few and far between and to end fairly rapidly, one way or another, hopefully for the better, right? But in modern life, while we may not be running and screaming terror from a lion that's chasing us, we tend to experience chronic, mild to moderate red zone uh, stress with very little opportunity for recovery in the green zone. Or if we do go into recovery, often our methods of recovery are not that good for us. We pay a price for them later, right? Uh, and that creates a major challenge for life today. Now, in the red zone, the body burns resources faster than it replenishes them. Long-term building projects like strengthening the immune system or digesting are put on hold. That's why people get constipated when they're stressed, for example. And in three broad umbrella terms, the mind is colored by, uh, I would use the words, fear, frustration, and heartache in terms of our three core needs. Now, the Buddha talked about um, hatred, greed, and delusion. To me, hatred maps really well as a poison, or in the traditional terms that he taught in, a fuel for the fire of suffering, the fuel of hatred, of aversion, of red zone reactivity in terms of the avoiding system of the brain, hatred. Greed, clearly, uh, red zone reactivity in terms of the approaching system of the brain. And he left out, I think, heartache. He 
He implied it. He talked about it. Recent scholarship has shown that uh, for him, love was a fully sufficient path to complete awakening. And, you know, scholarship today has shown that maybe if there was a better understanding at the time that that's what he taught, you know, after he died, there might not have been the need for the Mahayana sort of revision, if you will, in terms of bringing kind of more heart back into Dharma practice. But in any case, I think it's important to be very explicit about the social brain. The fact that arguably the, you know, reproductive advantages, the engine of biological evolution of social skills over the last several million years, minimally, if not longer, love, broadly defined, have been the primary driver of the evolution of the brain. So paying attention to the attaching system, paying attention to our needs in that regard, uh, honoring heartache on the one hand and love on the other. Uh, I think of heartache as a fourth poison, if you will, a fourth fuel on the fire of suffering, in addition to greed and hatred and delusion. So for me, anyway, that's my kind of overall model, right? So we have a choice, basically. I ask myself, what in the world could be going on? How do you operationalize the brain of a Buddha? Or an Arahant? Or someone in stream entry? Or someone just pretty far along in practice uh, ourselves in a really good day? What in the world could be going on in a brain when there's just no basis for resisting or grasping or clinging? There's no need for that. We really have come to peace, which the Buddha called the highest happiness. What in the world could be going on in that sort of a brain? Well, the brain of a Buddha does not have a choice about having a reptilian, mammalian, and primate human layers. The brain of a Buddha, or anybody, does not have a choice about our core needs for safety, satisfaction, and connection. Or doesn't have, we don't have a choice about these ongoing systems that are always trying to manage uh, avoiding harms, approaching rewards, and attaching to others. Our only choice is which setting the brain is in. Are we in the green zone or the red zone? The responsive mode or the reactive mode? Yes, this is a simplifying dichotomy and so forth, but basically we know the difference between the two states of mind. That's really the essence of the choice, this mode or that mode. And as I'll get to momentarily, the brain also evolved a negativity bias. So even though the green zone is our resting state, it is where we default when we're undisturbed, and the resting state of a system most fundamentally characterizes it. So the green zone most fundamentally characterizes us, which I think is really, really good news. On the other hand, we are profoundly vulnerable to being disturbed from that zone for the urgent, immediate needs of survival, and thus the negativity bias of the brain, which makes it very good at learning from bad experiences and relatively bad at learning from good ones, even though, very poignantly, positive experiences, when converted to brain structure, and there's the rub, are the primary source of the inner strengths, broadly defined, that we need to make our way through life. Inner strengths like resilience, positive mood, tranquility, mindfulness, concentration, sila, samadhi, and panya, right? Virtue, mindfulness, and wisdom. Those inner strengths are largely grown through positive experiences getting encoded in neural structure. The problem is the brain is very inefficient at turning fleeting positive mental states into lasting, useful, enduring neural traits. And that takes us to a real question of how do we do cultivation? How do we cultivate these qualities inside us with a brain that, you know, as you may know I've said, is like Velcro for the negative, but Teflon for the positive? And that's what I hope I can get into with you. Maybe after we do some discussions, some Q&A, and give me a chance to exhale. Okay. All right. All right. Any questions or comments so far? Yes. Thanks. What do you think? I have a question. All right. Great. Do you want to go to the mic, or I'll just repeat it for everybody, whatever you want? And we'll do a, certainly a little bit of this at least. Great. they not have the same kinds of minor stresses that stick around like we have? Irresponsible yeah. children, yeah. things like that. <laughs> oh, well said. And I think there's a tendency to sentimentalize and romanticize that life. It was hard. You know, in hunter-gatherer cultures uh, that, we've stu- that we've studied, scholars have studied, the infant mortality rate, or really up to age six, roughly five out of six babies die before their sixth birthday. You know, um, 
our son was born with the umbilical cord wrapped around his neck three times. You know, 50 years ago, 500 years, years ago for sure, that would have been a bad event for at least one, if not two people. You know, so yeah, I think it's tempting to do that. But if you look at, um, on the other hand, many hunter-gatherers, they're, it seems to take them about four hours a day to literally take care of all their bodily needs. There's some exceptions to that, but generally that's a loose figure, a rough figure. The rest of the time, what are they doing? They're hanging out, they're chilling, making love, they're just t- telling stories, they're gossiping, right? You look at primates, you look at a lot of what they do, primate bands, we're primates too, of course, but other primates, you know, our cousin, the other great apes, like the orangutans or the chimpanzees, the bonobos, the gorillas, and so forth. Most of the time, they're kind of hanging out, right? And so I, I think that uh, while on the one hand it's important to not romanticize the past, on the other hand, I think it's useful to appreciate that while modern life gives us things like pain control, and in many cultures, at least happily, the opportunity for the rule of law under many conditions and various other kinds of benefits. I'm a fan of refrigeration and ESPN and you know, ibuprofen. I'm a fan and all that. Um, that said, on the other hand, people are very stressed. And one of the takeaways for me from what I've learned about the territory of evolutionary neuropsychology is to have a very new appreciation for the slow grinding accumulation of negative experiences, particularly needless ones. I'll talk momentarily about a framework for me that I return to again and again about the three ways to engage the mind. I'm not talking about um, being Mr. Fix-It or Ms. Fix-It inside the head all the time, and I'm not talking about denying the negative or uh, you know, having a pie-in-the-sky kind of orientation. I think cultivation has a place in practice. It's not the whole of practice. But one of the things that has come to me from doing this work is do not underestimate the power of the dark side of the force. You know, do not underestimate the impact. I'll talk in a moment about the negativity bias and how rapidly uh, we learn from negative experiences. Anybody else? A couple more in the front row? I should make my sunglasses. This is really... Oh, now I can actually see people. I, can you give me one of those green eye shades, you know, that we kind of deal them or something? Okay, yeah, great. Hi, um, I'm Creel, and uh, you mentioned um, that the negativity, negativity bias is in comparison to, I guess, positive experiences. Um, it resonates a lot more significantly. So when you have traumatic events, like you mentioned, in undergathered societies, yeah. the losing of um, a child in the first six years, is there a way... Um, or what does a brain look like if you have great experience or positive experiences? Mm. Does that, on the flip side, I know um, positive for the brain is like tough on and those positive experiences, but does that kind of create neural substrates or does that speed up um, the, or, I guess, the wires of the brain in a certain way? And is that also representative of going to the red zone because it is also out of I'm not totally sh- I think I get your question. Maybe why don't I respond this way and see if it's on target, okay? okay. Right? And I'm going to use an analogy that, of course, came to me on my way to a Buddhist Geeks conference to liken the brain to the internet. So imagine if the internet had a negativity bias. What that would mean is that, first of all, as it were broadly to find bad news on the internet, you know, like Kim Kardashian updates. No, I'm just making that up. But, you know, like disasters, horrible things, you know, just just anger, violence, terrible imagery, ew, bad news, okay? What if, the, what if that actually changed the structure of the Internet such that those negative, that negative information, those websites, if you will, those pages, sucked traffic, got more traffic, they, in a strange attractor kind of way, all right? And what if that negative information moving through the Internet actually changed the Internet broadly so it became increasingly affected by negative news? While simultaneously, in the Internet worldwide, you know, altogether, um, while simultaneously uh, 
good news, useful information, pragmatically useful information, let alone things that are enjoyable, or aesthetically beautiful, let's say, um, did not, by its nature, tend to get much traffic. Right? What would we have over time? And that's, that's the brain that we have. For example, if you take equally intense stimuli to the brain, one is pleasant, the other is unpleasant, going to the Vedanas, or what's called in psychology, the hedonic tones of experience, pleasant, unpleasant, and neutral. As a sidebar, I wonder sometimes if a fourth Vedana is emerging, uh, for lack of a better word, call it heartfelt, you know, that tends to incline us. Because, you know, the unpleasant Vedana tends to activate the avoiding system of the brain. A pleasant Vedana, or feeling tones, or uh, hedonic tones, tend to activate the approaching system of the brain. And I wonder if there's emerging in us, in terms of evolution, uh, a more modern, if you will, over the last million or so years, certainly 100,000 or 200,000 years, a heartfelt Vedna that tends to activate the attaching system of the brain, just as a sidebar, okay? So equally, but keeping it simple, right? Um, carrots and sticks, right? Pleasant, unpleasant. Equally intense stimuli, pleasant, unpleasant, uh, the brain will activate more to the unpleasant. Two, negative experiences have, as it were, dedicated pathways, and they, become, they move more rapidly into neural structure, which means experientially we learn them quicker. Pain is more remembered than pleasure in terms of shaping behavior. We learn faster from pain than from pleasure. Daniel Kahneman, the psychologist who won a Nobel Prize for economics on his work on loss aversion or prospect theory, showed that most people will work a lot harder to avoid a loss than to, than to get an equivalent gain. Uh, in couples, classically, uh, you know, uh, um, it usually takes about five positive interactions to balance one negative one. Long-lasting couples usually must have at least a five-to-one ratio of positive interactions to one negative interaction, you know, as an ongoing kind of average over, over time. Or you think about... Uh, Learn helplessness, how vulnerable we are to learning a sense of futility, entrapment, and defeat. You can train dogs and who have a motivational uh, system very much like our own. You can train, train dogs and even humans into a sense of defeat very quickly. Four, five, half a dozen trials. They're depressed and they are defeated. They just give up. And then it takes many dozens of trials to help that dog and humans in different kinds of studies that pass human subjects review, um, you know, to actually learn again some sense of confidence. So again, we have a brain that's very vulnerable in that way. Now the interesting thing, and this gets me jazzed up, and you know, this is where we're going to go momentarily, is that on the one hand, we have a brain that is very rapidly sensitized to the negative. It isn't just that it learns negative quickly, which it does. It learns negative faster than positive. It's that over time, it gets better and better at learning negative. It gets better and better at converting momentary negative mental states to lasting neural negative traits. On the other hand, new research just beginning is starting to show that repeated cultivation and use of, and especially as I'll get to momentarily, the conversion of fleeting uh, positive experiences to lasting neural structure could actually sensitize the brain in the other direction, could actually turn this brain increasingly into becoming Velcro for the good, not just Velcro for the bad. That's a second order kind of effect. That's a meta effect. And that really interests me a lot. So that does seem to me to go to what you're getting at, if I get it right. Yeah, that's exactly what okay. I was asking. Uh, maybe I should, I have another second part, but I'll yeah. say that for now. Cool. Okay. Yeah, and I'll stick around, by the way, afterward. Very happy to. And I should mention, just because of the slide chaos, which I'm so glad it happened. This is really good. Um, but my, on my website, uh, you can go there, sonrecanson.net. Tons of this stuff is freely offered. And there's a lot of backup material and the science of what I'm doing here and all the rest of that. And you're very welcome to use that material and you know, share it with others freely how you like. Thank okay, you. yeah. Maybe one more person, and then I'll keep going. We'll do something experiential real soon. Great, thanks.
Why do you think that's true? Did, well, first, when she's, if I may, yeah. when you, she, <laughs> uh, I can't read your name there, but anyway, you, it talks about LTP, long-term potentiation. It really is, it's the kind of neuro neurologization of learning, right? And you're saying, right, that you have a notion that meditation or contemplative practice, let's say, actually increasingly helps the brain learn faster and deeper and better, correct? Okay. Yes, absolutely. Can you say why you think that? Um, I don't know, just personal experience yeah. and yeah. Um, kind of that paradigm shift that you have when yeah. you do have an active meditation practice yeah. versus when you kind of fall off the wagon and you think everybody right. gets there. Yeah. And whenever you're in that meditation practice, you have this positive, more positive outlook, you stop having that negative bias as much, and your yeah. brain starts to shift. So I think it's might be where you're going with the cultivation, right. but um, I'm interested in brain chemistry and that kind of stuff. Okay, great. So, yeah. so that's just personal notion, personal knowledge. Oh, that's great. Well, I'll try to speak to that then. So people usually talk about long-term potentiation at the synaptic level. So I'm, I'm going to do it. I'm going to respond both at the micro level and kind of the macro level. Okay. So first of all, research does show. Uh, that meditation or related close cousins, like mindfulness training in general, broadly defined, um, actually have tremendous benefits for both physical health as well as psychological health. I think that if Merck or Pfizer could patent meditation in terms of its research-proven benefits compared to many other medical treatments, we'd be seeing ads for meditation every night on TV, not so much Prozac, you know, more mantra work or something like that, right? So that's on the one hand, and I think that's really true. And when your mind is calmer, you're more able to learn, you're less jacked up. Second, you get more control over your attention, which is this combination spotlight and vacuum cleaner. You know, attention illuminates what it rests upon and then sucks it into your brain. Because as I said earlier, uh, neurons that fire together wire together, especially in the field of focused attention. But most of us don't have very good control over that spotlight. So at the macro level, we become better able to learn, I think, very much to your point. And then at the micro level, what's really kind of neat is that um, what accelerates synaptic formation, which is kind of the wiring deep down that's the physical basis of learning, hopefully positive learning or negative learning, one thing that facilitates that is dopamine, which tracks reward. So the more that in our contemplative practice, we tend to activate uh, positive emotional states, even if they're subtle, like tranquility is a fairly subtle positive emotional state, but if it pervades the mind, if we fully give over to it, it's just about all that's going on. It perplexed me for a while as to why the Buddha and his contemporaries, who were perfectly prepared to do incredibly intense ascetic practice, why would two of the five jhana factors, the jhanas constitute, the four form jhanas, as you probably know, constitute the right concentration or wise concentration element of the Noble Eightfold Path? These non-ordinary, profound, you're no longer in Kansas any longer, you know, if you've ever experienced them, uh, states of absorption. Why traditionally would the five jhana, jhana factors consist of applied attention, sustained attention, rapture or bliss, and joy, as well as unification of consciousness. Why would 40%, two out of five, right, have to do with intense positive emotion? And one reason for that, I think, is because when you're in that state, you're getting a lot of dopamine, you're getting a lot of norepinephrine, another neurotransmitter that's very involved in kind of states of alertness, brightening of the mind, as they say in Tibet. Those two neurotransmitters really promote synaptic formation as well as help the mind stay steady for a variety of other kinds of reasons. So I think even at the synaptic level, way down in the basement, if you will, uh, of learning and growth and change and transformation, contemplative practice could really help. And you probably caught my nod, you know, my bow in the direction of positive emotion. And so maybe I'll, I'll go there and segue fairly quickly into teaching some methods that I think are very useful for turning fleeting mental states into lasting neural traits that we really care about. Okay, So, kind of move on? All right, so as a framework, as I said earlier, it's been very useful for me to appreciate um, that I think there are just three ways to engage the mind. We can transcend the mind altogether, but then we're out of the natural frame. Inside the natural frame, 
we can witness the mind. We can feel the feelings, experience the experience, uh, hold our sorrows in a large open space of awareness, uh, step back, observing ego in the psychology term, uh, get out of the movie and witness it instead from 20 rows back. That's one way to engage the mind. It's fantastic. I think it's the most important of the three. It's absolutely fundamental. But is that all that we need to do? There's also the wise effort or right effort aspect of the Noble Eightfold Path, that part of practice, which is about reducing the negatives in the mind and growing the positives. In effect, if the mind were like a garden, we could witness the garden, we could pull weeds, or we could plant flowers, right? Or in six words, let be, let go, let in. So it's in this frame now that I want to talk about what promotes letting in. What does actually, based on science, what does accelerate um, our positive learning, our cultivation of wholesome qualities of mind and heart. Right? Well, it's interesting. See, negative experiences, negative mental states, fleeting patterns of mental neural activity, right, which haven't yet built structure, negatively charged mental neural co-arising states very quickly convert to traits. Once burned, twice shot. Right? Never forget. We learn from our negative experiences. But meanwhile, positive experiences unless they're million-dollar moments, really, really intense, you know, samadhi, bliss, or you want to marry me? You know, for these fantastic moments, right? Yes, um, or whatever. But anyway, you know, unless it's that, positive experiences use standard-issue memory systems. Well, standard-issue memory systems have short-term buffers, again, to simplify and summarize a lot of research. And material patterns of information need to be held in these short-term memory buffers for long enough, 5, 10, 20 seconds in a row, long enough to transfer to long-term storage, to start encoding in neural structure. That's great, but how often do we actually do that? How often do we actually stay with our fleeting, momentary, positive experiences more than a few seconds in a row? We might be having one positive experience after another, but the next one coming in to short-term buffers dislodges the current one before it can start sifting down into long-term storage. That means that many, many positive experiences wash through the brain like water through a sieve, while negative ones are caught each time. It's been deeply humbling to me personally when I, as a longtime therapist and teacher in various kinds of venues and settings and traditions, it's been humbling for me to realize how many of the hard-won, useful mental states that people were having, or in fact I was having, made no difference in the brain. They were good in the moment, but they had no lasting value because they didn't convert to structure. There was no learning. Structure equals learning. No, no structure, no learning, no real change, which flattens the curse of a person's learning curve through life, is disheartening, and slows down the fruits of our efforts and continues, you know, perpetuates suffering and harm. Right? What are the factors that are known Lots of research on learning. What are the factors that are known to accelerate the conversion of mental states to neural traits? There are five major factors. These are not the only, there are probably a couple more, but these are the ones where they have a lot of effect. One is duration. We've got to stay with it. The longer the better. Second factor is intensity. The more intense the experience, the more of a neural trace it's likely to leave behind. Multimodality, that's the third factor. Feeling it in the body, uh, really sensing it here, tracking the emotion of it, moving the idea down into a felt sense, uh, acting it out, moving the body to represent that posture a little bit, feeling it in the face, uh, doing it in behavior. That deepens memory traces. Fourth factor, novelty. The brain is a novelty detector. It's constantly looking for what's new. What's, what's, you know, what's fresh and what's the news, right? Um, so helping ourselves notice what's fresh in our experience, again, will accelerate the conversion to neural structure. I think that's another reason why meditation is very helpful in that regard, because it helps us appreciate that each breath is a fresh breath, right? And then the fifth major factor is, is personal relevance, salience. Why should I care, right? Why does this matter to me? So the more that we can bring one or more of these factors, particularly duration, helping it last, 
10, 20 seconds in a row, one or two dozen seconds in a row, if not longer, and then ideally adding the intensity to it, feeling it in the body, seeing what's fresh about it, and or personal relevance, that will increase memory traces. And that, for me, takes us to what I think of as the four fundamental steps of taking in the good, uh, which I use uh, the acronym HEAL, H-E-A-L, to summarize. So I'm going to teach it to you, and then we're going to do it. Okay? All right. Enough blather, more feelings. Good. All right. So first step, we have to activate the positive state in the first place. Usually because we notice we're already having a positive experience. Right? I'm surviving the loss of my slides. <laughs> Relief is highly underrated. Trust me. It's high, you know, as a useful positive experience. Uh, maybe we accomplish something. Uh, that's a nice positive experience. On the 0 to 10 intensity scale, most positive experiences are 1s and 2s, or 0.4s, right? Occasionally there's a 6 or a 7 that comes rolling along. Most of them are pretty, pretty lightweight, but they're real. They count, okay? So in the first step, we have, H for have, a positive experience, right? Usually because we notice we're having it, sometimes we create it. We might think of something we're grateful for, or we might deliberately call up compassion, or loving kindness. Or we might be in a tough situation at work or in life or starting a business. Uh, things are you know, challenging. We pull up some sense of determination. We create a positive experience. Either way, we're having it in the first place. We've activated it. Then we move into the second, third, and fourth steps where we install this activated useful mental state into neural structure. And we only do this a handful of times each day. It's not like we become preoccupied with this. But, you know, half a dozen, pardon me, um, half a dozen times a day, roughly, half a minute or less, that's less than five minutes a day, you can really, really gradually change your brain for the better. Okay? So the second step, we enrich the experience. E for enrich. Right? We help it last. We protect it. We make sanctuary for it in our minds. In the moment, 10, 20, 30 seconds straight, it's a kind of absorption practice. We give ourselves over to it. There's a kind of yielding. We let it... We let it be here in us. We help ourselves have it. We don't push it away. What's interesting, when you start doing this kind of practice, you bump into all these blocks to letting yourself actually receive a positive experience uh, in a way that involves a kind of befriending of oneself that's very heartfelt. So that's the enriching phase. And then in the third step, we absorb it, A for absorb. We prime memory systems. We make them more receptive, so they're more inclined to convert to structure by intending and sensing that the experience is coming in. Some people, like me, do this visually. I imagine like an experience sifting down into me like golden, you know, what was that? Uh, the golden compass, the golden dust, you know, Pullman's great books are coming in or soothing balm or with children, I'll do this a lot with kids because I see kids, um, my practice sometimes, a jewel in the treasure chest of the heart or maybe you just know it's going into you. You know, bottom line, if you're enriching the experience 10, 20 seconds straight, it will convert to neural structure. It can't help but do that. Neurons that fire together wire together, but we can turbocharge that process. We can accelerate our learning curve by intending and sensing that it's sinking in. Those are the three core steps of taking the good, purely positively focused. The optional fourth step is to link. That gives us H-E-A-L, to link where we're holding both positive and negative material in awareness at once. We're helping the positive material be more prominent, so it gradually associates into the negative material, so that when the negative material reconsolidates in a very dynamic and therefore vulnerable to intervention kind of process, when the negative material reconsolidates back into neural structure, it takes some of those positive associations with it. And then when we call it up again, or it just reactivates as a kind of mood or an inclination or an assumption or an expectation, when it activates again, it tends to bring some of those positive associations with it. Okay. Do you want to try it? Yeah. Just try it? Okay. So do it in your own way, however you like. It's a little artificial, but we'll see how this goes. All right. And I think I'm going to do this in a couple of cycles, and then hear what you think about it, okay? So, and let me just check my time. I'm ending at 8.15 or 8.30? 8.15? 9 o'clock? Midnight? No, no? 
<laughs> When's the bar open? Oh, we don't do that, right? That's the fifth precept. What was I talking about? <laughs> All right. Is it really 8.30 or 8.15? 8.30. Okay. We're going to roll. This is awesome. Okay, good. So remember those three systems, right? Lizard, mouse, monkey. We're going to do one for each. So on cue, right? Notice a really interesting truth that is a truth most of the time, that you're actually all right right now. In other words, see if you can help yourself in the first step to have a positive experience of actually not being about to die. (laughs) You're actually all right. Moment to moment, the body is telling the brain all is well. In most moments. Sometimes you're not all right right now. There have been times I haven't been all right right now. But mostly we are all right right now. And I'm talking about not wasting that experience, turning it into neural structure. So you could notice you're all right right now. You could keep your eyes open or closed. And on the basis of that, you could sense an underlying peace, a fundamental bodily reinforced sense of basic safety so that you can relax any unnecessary guarding or bracing and experience a growing tranquility, one of the seven factors of awakening. So I'll be quiet for about 20 seconds or so as you explore what it's like to keep giving yourself over to a deepening sense of peacefulness, a relaxing, a coming home to a basic peace. As you do this, let it sink into your body. Notice what it's like to let yourself have and receive this experience. Maybe even be a little changed by it. Good. And then in the second step of this little practice here, this experiment. Let's explore now the approaching reward system by seeing if you can locate some basic sense of gladness or gratitude. Perhaps thinking of something that makes you feel happy. And seeing if you can help yourself experience a kind of falling away of grasping. So there's less and less basis, increasingly no real basis, for any kind of disturbance about not having enough. And instead, I'll be quiet again, opening to whatever is real for you as an underlying well-being and a growing coming home to contentment. Letting this experience sink into you as you sink into it. And then in the third step, opening to, in terms of the attaching system, some sense of feeling cared about, bringing to mind others doesn't need to be a perfect relationship, that give you a feeling of being included or that you're seen or appreciated or liked and loved. Could be people in your life today or your past, could be a pet. 
could be a friend, maybe putting a hand on the heart or on your cheek, as if the most loving being in the universe were wishing you well. Perhaps thinking of someone who you know loves you. What's it like to feel loved? Letting these feelings sink in. Move down into your body. Filling the hole in your heart. If your mind wanders, that's fine. You can bring it back. Also being aware of your own caring for others. Perhaps thinking of someone that you naturally feel compassion for, or kindness, you wish them well. Coming home to, resting in a sense of love. Love flowing in, love flowing out. Love sinking into you as you sink into it. Altogether, based on peace, contentment, and love, coming home to the green zone. Little basis, little deficit or disturbance, little basis or no basis at all for any kind of craving. Letting this state of mind really sink in. And then coming back and I'll say a few more words about this and wrap up. And you're very welcome, of course, to continue to experience some basic sense, however it was for you, including subtle or mild, some basic sense of peace, contentment, and love. The interesting thing is that what we just did over a few minutes is a fairly structured kind of practice. But most of the time, when we take in the good, most of the time when we convert, fleeting positive states to lasting neural traits, it's in the flow of life, just in the middle of everyday living. It's not some kind of special thing, but instead of wasting these useful moments, we help them land. We help them sink in on the basis of which we build up more inner strengths, including positive feelings, positive mood, and we have more capacities, more more inside ourselves to offer to other people as our own cup runneth over. It's interesting that they say in Tibet, take the fruit as the path. In other words, if the fruit of a really good life certainly at least includes, broadly defined, qualities of inner peace, a sense of reward and fulfillment, contentment, and qualities of feeling loved and loving, that's the aim of a good life. Because of experience-dependent neuroplasticity, Every time we take in the good of these experiences, every time we help ourselves experience that our core needs, in this moment at least, are fundamentally being met, we build up the neural substrates of the responsive mode. In effect, using like a strange attractor model, we deepen the divot, if you will, of the green zone, the responsive mode. Or to use a different metaphor, it's as if the keel of a sailboat Uh, We deepen the keel of our personal sailboat in the water as we absorb again and again, as we take in again and again, the fundamental sense of core needs being met so that as the worldly winds blow, increasingly they don't knock our boat over because our keel has gotten a lot deeper. 
or if that something hits us hard, we recover a lot more quickly. And for me, that's a beautiful path of practice. It's in the larger frame in which we also witness our pain when it's there without trying to fix it immediately. When it feels right, we move into releasing it. We let it go. We pull that weed, if you will. We abandon that difficult mind state. And then when it feels appropriate as well, we replace what we've released. We plant some flowers in the space you know, left by the weeds we've pulled out. So it's in that context that we're speaking here. And yet, bit by bit, right, synapse by synapse, we can deepen that internal felt sense of needs met and therefore undo the underlying causes of craving, which is a fundamental cause of suffering and harm. I want to leave you with a quote from the Buddha from the Dhammapada. He says, Think not lightly of good, saying it will not come to me. Drop by drop is the water pot filled. Likewise, the wise one, gathering it little by little, fills oneself with good. And as they also say in Tibet, if you take care of the minutes, the years will take care of themselves. The minutes, the drops, the synapses, that's what's within our sphere of influence. That's what we can actually make a difference uh, with regard to. And that's the great opportunity, I think, for ourselves, whether we draw upon technology to help ourselves or whether we do it through traditional means, to build up the good inside ourselves, to build up our own water pot so we have more and more to offer to other people. So thank you for putting up with my technical difficulties. Uh,